So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, first I will talk a little bit more about variational autoencoders to motivate the next model called generative adversarial networks. So GANs, as they're called, have been very popular. Has the original GAN papers received more than 1,000 citations in something like one and a half years? So it's very something that people are very excited about. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about a few extensions of these two models. So first a little bit about uh, variation auto, auto encoders again, like it's just a, a, a reminder and a motivator for the next model. So there are two good things about variation auto encoders. First is that they are likelihood based. This means that once we have trained the model, we can we get a lower bound to the likelihood that we can use as a replacement of the likelihood, and we can use this likelihood to measure how well does the model actually describe new data. So we can actually, once we have trained the model, we get this p of x or the p of x lower bound, then we can insert some test data and we can see what value we get there. And then if we have some other model, could be a completely different model, but we can evaluate the likelihood on that model, then we can compare these two and see whether this new model, the variational model, works better and that means that it has captured some essential parts of the statistical relationships between the different dimensions in the data. Another nice thing about the model is once we have trained uh, the, the generative model, so that means that we have generative model now has a, a latent variable prior distribution and the likelihood function which is the conditional of the observed data given the latent once that we have trained these two models, usually we'll keep uh, the prior fixed and then we'll change the parameters in the conditional distribution. Once we have trained these two, uh, then we can synthesize new data as described here. We can draw a C from the prior distribution over the latent manifold and then we insert that in the conditional distribution and draw an X. And now we can look at this X. If it's for example images, we can look at how well does these images look like the natural images that we had in the training set that we trained on. And if it doesn't look right, then we know that something is missing in our model and this can be like an inspiration for further model development. There are also a few cons about this model. First of all, we can have uh, deficiencies in the way we define the variational distribution. So the variational distribution ideally should fit the posterior distribution over the latent variables that we can write like this fruit-based theorem. Usually, and this is the reason why we use variational distributions, this posterior distribution is intractable, so that means that we cannot uh, calculate it. So we, that's why we need the variational approach. So we cannot measure either directly whether we have a good fit of Q to, to P. But if we don't have that, then the generative model we learn will anyway be poor because you can see that the optimization we perform in the variational bound is a combination of optimizing the, uh, the generative model and the variational distribution. And if the variational distribution is far from anything interesting, then we cannot hope that our generative model will learn something as well. Then the last thing, last bad thing about, uh, about the uh, about the variational distribution and, uh, and more generally about the likelihood based approaches is that that we of course as modelers we just invent the likelihood function we just invent find a suitable uh, p of c uh, p of x given c uh, we just invent that and and uh, and maybe it's kind of just it's just dictated by some some uh, computational considerations but if this model uh, is not a very good model, then uh, meaning that it's a poor fit to reality, maybe we have, uh, we have a lot of data and reality is uh, like image data, image net, reality is very complex, then if we use a wrong model, they will not learn a very good generative model. And this motivates uh, work on making better likelihood functions or maybe avoiding likelihood functions altogether. And this is what the GANs uh, are about. So it's a uh, latent variable generative approach, but it's non-probabilistic and it doesn't use an explicit likelihood function. So sometimes it's called the implicit generative approach. And I have a list of references at the end of the slides and you can see one. there's one paper there that discusses this kind of relationship between these implicit and explicit likelihood approaches. Yes. 
So good thing about it is that it does not depend on the likelihood function. So the kind of we 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 uh, avoid having to make a likelihood function. We avoid having to make a likelihood function that definitely will not match reality. And this is especially revealed when we have large data sets. Another good thing about it is that we can actually synthesize new data. The, bad, the con is here that we cannot make this quantitative model comparison that we discussed that we had for the VAEs. We can do it indirectly if we, for example, train a GAN as part of a semi-supervised approach. Then if we get a good semi-supervised performance, then it's a sign that we actually have learned a good GAN model. And I also have a reference to that in the list of references. The idea is quite simple actually. So we have some real data and we have a generative model that takes essentially kind of white Gaussian noise and pulls that through a function to generate some data. So we have to learn this generator, but we also have to learn a discriminator that can discriminate between uh, generated data and, and real data. And the idea now is to make this, gener uh, this discriminator as good as possible so that it gets a low classification error in, in, in kind of saying what is, what is true data and what is false data. And then we have, a, we have a generator that is actually optimized to fool the discriminator. So that's the whole idea. And here is uh, the way it works. So again, we have this, we have this prior distribution over, uh, over the latent variables. So that could be an IID uh, multivariate normal distribution. And then we, we have a function G, which is now a function that takes this noise and then passes through that and then generates something that has the same dimensionality as the data. So it could be um, an image, for example, it could have the dimensionality of an image. And then the second part we have is this uh, binary true generated data discriminator, we call that D, that takes the X in and this X could either be a real data point or it could be uh, something that we generated in this generator process. Sorry, what's happening now? Okay, I have a small problem here with my slides. Let me see if I should just open it again. Yeah, now it works again. That was good. Yes, real life problems here. Um, yes. So now the, we can write down the objective. Uh, so if we have generated data, we need to use both the generator and the discriminator. And we want, uh, as I said, we want to have, uh, so this minus log, sorry, that should not be a minus. Uh, that should not be a minus. This should just, this log one minus uh, the discriminator. That is, this is this kind of ban binary logistic output uh, discriminator. Uh, so uh, if we say if we look at first of the max, that means that we want to uh, we want to label uh, this as a generated example, right? That's why we have one minus the probability of the true, and then we have a min over the generator because we want the generator to fool the discriminator, right? So we have this min max objective. For true data, it's much simpler. There we simply want to maximize the probability that this is classified as a true example. Yes. So in practice it's actually quite hard to solve this min-max objective, right? If you remember uh, back to how we optimize neural networks, normally we just have, we just minimize the, 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 our objective function, our cross, our cross entropy plus some realization. Good thing, and this is maybe why it's so popular, is that it actually generates very, very nice synthesized data. And, and this is, of course, kind of very sexy. So whether it really captures the true underlying distribution of the data sets, or whether it actually finds a, like, a relatively few points that it synthesizes really well in this very high dimensional space manifold of real images is not so clear. It's very hard to quantify that. Here's a small movie made by two uh, PhD students from our department, you can see this nice, nice blog post, Let's see if I can play this. So here we, what we do in this video is that we walk around in latent space. So we make a random walk in the C space 
and then for each point in the C space we generate data points and this is trained on a data set of celebrity faces so you recognize some familiar faces in this in this image very nice yes a little bit more about uh, GANs and uh, variation auto encoder extensions so one there's been many papers on this, many extensions. There was a period where there was like a new uh, GAN, some some letter, then GAN afterwards, uh, afterwards uh, uh, variant on the GAN. So it's something that has exploded. Uh, but here's some here's one that is quite nice, and it's used for 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 uh, neural style transfer. The idea is now that you have two different styles. For example, you have a Van Gogh style and a Cezanne style. And now you want to make a, a system that can that can actually take an image in Van Gogh style and make that into a Cezanne style and the other way around. So you have two generators, one F that takes a Van Gogh painting and make that into a, 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 like a, a, the same painting but in the Cezanne style and then you have G which goes the other way. And what you now want to do is that you want to uh, learn G and F in the same way as with the GAN, so we have the GAN objective, but we now add another objective. So we say if we take, for example, X, which is a Van Gogh painting, and we apply first F, the transformation, from Van Gogh to Cezanne, and then now uh, we apply G, going from Cezanne to Van Gogh, then this kind of applying this transformation twice, we should get back to the same original image, right? So we should say that X is more or less equal to G, uh, sorry, to F applied on X and then we apply G on this F of X and the same thing for this kind of cycle of the sun and actually this procedure works really really nicely here you can see some images and you can also uh, go to the web and find a very nice movie of a horse that is transformed into a zebra and it's, it's kind of uh, running around and it works really convincingly so very visually very appealing and nice uh, framework Yes, so the last thing I want to talk about is what is called grammar VAEs and this is something that could be interesting to use in cases where we actually know something about the structure of the data. For example, if we have to do with text, we might have some rules about how, how this text is generated and if we train a standard uh, variation autoencoder on this, it might be that some of the data we synthesize will not obey these rules because the rules are only kind of implicit in the training data. But if we have explicit information about these rules, then we can try to build that into the model. And that's the idea in this grammar VAE. And they apply it to, uh, to a specific way of describing uh, uh, um, uh, kind of molecule structure called smiles and then use that to actually make a latent representation such that if you draw from this latent representation you get a new molecule and it might be that you have a molecule with nice properties that map to some certain place in the space and you now want to exploit similar molecules with also nice uh, properties by actually moving around in the neighborhood of this uh, point of uh, you are interested in and then generating new data and this new data if you apply this grammar rules on top of it will be valid molecules so here's an example, you have this so-called context-free grammar, so that's a way, this grammar is a small grammar that can generate quite general uh, uh, mathematical expressions, including uh, sin sinus and, and the exponential function, and it can have x as a variable and numerical values of 1, 2, 3, it's defined this way. So it's kind of a production rule for how to do this, and you can build that into the, into the uh, in, into the uh, later uh, into the variational uh, model by using this framework. I'll not go so much into it. You can read the details yourself, but you can see it's about you. Here you have the smiles grammar rules, and then you build a parse tree, and then you extract rules from that, and you convert those rules to a one hot uh, input, and then you map that to the latent space. And this is the encoder, and you have a similar decoder in this framework. Here are the references. And thank you.